So let's move on to look at some of the nutrients of interest in plant-based diets. Protein, iron, zinc, calcium, and B12, uh, calcium and vitamin D, B12, omega-3s, and iodine. I did cover protein in my last lecture, but I decided to cover it again here uh, for those of you that are just catching this lecture. So starting with protein, I think this is my favorite protein cartoon of all times. This little rodent is asking this big muscular gorilla, uh, no meat at all, are you sure you're getting enough protein? And the reality is, is anyone who's plant-based has been asked the question, where are you getting your protein? <laughs> or where do you get your protein? But the reality, of course, is even the largest mammals on the planet manage to get enough protein from plants to build huge muscles. So puny people probably can too. We're so small by comparison. There are many, many athletes and bodybuilders and healthy individuals who manage to get enough protein purely from plants. So the big question to ask is how much protein do we actually need? Well, the RDA for protein it's generally stated in terms of grams per kilogram per day. An infant needing 1.5 or so uh, during early infancy, 1.2 during later infancy. Children need about one, uh, toddlers about 1.05 and older children about 0.95. Uh, teens about 0.85, adults about 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. And for those of you that are as familiar with kilograms of pound, um, or a kilogram is 2.2 pounds. Uh, and then um, for pregnancy and lactation, it's a little higher, 1.1 during pregnancy, 1.3 during lactation. So what does that mean in terms of grams per day? Well, the RDA in grams per day refers or applies only to a specific reference body weight, which you see in the red uh, uh, numbers on, on the left-hand side here. And, and so it, you have to adjust this number for individuals uh, because everybody has a bit different body weight. But these reference body weights, for reference body weights, you would be looking at about 13 grams for a toddler, about 19 for a 48 year old, about 34 for a 9 to 13 year old, and then somewhere between about 46 and 56 for, for teens and adults, about 71 for pregnant and lactating women. You need more, more for athletes. And I'm not talking about, you know, people that do, like I do an hour of exercise a day. I'm talking about competitive athletes. So there, there is no separate RDA for them, but uh, 1.2 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day are generally recommended by, you know, health authorities and, and uh um, you know, in position statements and so on, depending on the individual's training. Uh, it is, has been suggested that we may need more for seniors. So there's no separate RDA for seniors in North America, although protein digestibility and synthesis are reduced. Some countries actually do have a separate RDA, like Australia, for example, has a separate RDA for seniors. But consensus is building that a consumption of 1 to 1.3 grams per kilogram per day reduces age-related muscle loss. Achieving this level of intake uh, can be challenging uh, because energy needs are typically reduced in this population. So they eat less, uh, but they need more protein. So it's a, it's a little bit more challenging. If you do the math, so you take an athlete or senior who needs 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram body weight, that, that person weighs 75 kilos or 165 pounds, they would require about 90 grams of protein per day. Well, for an athlete who consumes 3,000 uh, calories, that would amount to about 12% of his calories from protein. That's really easy to achieve on almost any diet. Um, for a senior eating 1,800 calories per day, that would amount to 20% of calories from protein. And that is more difficult to achieve on a plant-based diet. So what we're saying here is we probably need to focus a little bit more on ensuring that we've got a decent source of protein in each meal uh, for seniors. We possibly may need more for people who are eating truly whole food plant-based diets. So fiber in plant cell walls reduces protein digestibility. So for those eating very high fiber whole food plant-based diet, uh, some experts recommend an increase of 30% for toddlers, 20% for 
for children four to eight, fifteen percent for children uh, nine plus, and teens, and ten percent for for adults. Uh, this is not necessary for people who regularly eat lower fiber foods, light plant-based meat alternatives, tofu, soy milk, peanut butter, those kinds of foods, uh, or for lacto-ovo vegetarian uh, uh, people who regularly include dairy and eggs in their diet. Uh, if we look at protein digestibility, protein digestibility can be increased by reducing anti-nutritional factors such as trypsin inhibitors and lectins by soaking, sprouting, fermenting, and cooking foods. Uh, break it, but we can reduce or increase protein digestibility by breaking down fiber, by grinding, blending, making a smoothie, other food processing techniques that reduce particle size, thereby freeing up uh, the protein to be absorbed. And by removing or reducing fiber through refining, which of course isn't our best option from a nutritional uh, perspective. So if you look at the actual digestibility of food, you can see that these lower fiber foods uh, or foods that have had the particles uh, broken down, we, absor we, we digest about 92 to 96% of the protein. So that's things like, you know, white uh, flour, bread, soy protein isolate, peanut butter, tofu, or even whole wheat uh, flour or bread. Um, that's not that much different from what we would absorb from, from animal products that have no fiber at all, like beef or milk or eggs. Uh, of course, we do absorb a little bit less from higher fiber whole uh, plant foods like oatmeal at 86%, lentils at 84 and most other legumes, somewhere between 72 and 89% of the protein being digested. So if we you know, consider these additions for whole food plant-based eaters, we would be increasing, you know, the grams of protein per kilogram body weight. You can see in the various groups uh, a little, you know, by the, the amounts uh, recommended, the 30, 20, 15, and 10 percent. And so we, we would be looking at, you know, close to 1.4 for toddlers, a uh, little over the one for, for children, close to one for teens and close to 0.9 for adults and about 1.2 for pregnancy, 1.4 for lactation. And what that means in terms of grams a day is we're looking at around close to the 20 grams for young children, around the 40 for, for older children, and around the 50 to 60 for, for teens and adults, and, and around 78 for pregnant and lactating women. So average requirements uh, for protein are 46 grams a day for women, 56 for men, if we add 10%, it would be 50 grams for women, 62 for men. So it's, it's still not uh, a terribly high amount of protein. So, for, so what are actual intakes? Well, in, in uh, let's see, seven or eight studies, two, four, six, seven studies here, uh, you can see that average intakes in meat, and this is health conscious individuals. Most of these studies are looking at health conscious individuals. 92 grams a day on average, um, and, and for, for vegetarian, 76, and for vegan, 72. So you can see they're all, uh, you know, have a pretty, pretty good amount above that sort of RDA. So what about intakes in toddlers? Well, Vecchi looked at that. They looked at 430 one to three-year-old children. Average intakes were 2.7 grams per kilogram per day for all omnivores, 2.3 for lacto-ovo, 2.4 for vegans. And the RDA is 1.05 grams per kilogram per day. So they were all well beyond double the RDA. So not much of a problem uh, achieving uh, needs. What about older children? Well, again, the Vecchi Youth Study looked at 401 6 to 18 year olds. Their average intakes were, were 1.36 for omnivores, 1.14 for lacto ovo, and 1.16 for vegans. The RDA is 0.85 to 0.95 grams per kilogram per day. So again, above uh, the RDA. So, you know, if you look at, and you can see why if you start to look at the protein content of selected foods. So we get about 15 to 30 grams of protein in a cup of soybeans or three ounces of veggie meat or a cup, a half a cup of tofu or a cup of lentils or other legumes. That's about the same as what we get from three ounces of meat, poultry or fish. We get some, you know, six to 13 in, you know, a quarter cup of hemp seeds, a cup of, you know, cooked grains like spelt wheat or camu, a 
quarter cup of pumpkin seeds and, you know, and then all of the other foods like nuts and soy milk and quinoa and so forth. Um, this isn't much different than what you'd get from a couple of eggs or a cup of milk or an ounce of cheese. Plant-based eaters generally get enough protein unless they get insufficient calories. They have eating disorders, illnesses, or, or they just don't get enough food. Uh, this is not that common in North America. Most people don't have a problem getting enough calories. Uh, second is their diets are just very poorly balanced or poorly planned. They're high fat, high sugar junk food diets, like you know, soda and French fries, tea and toast diets, uh, and some fruitarian diets may not uh, make the cut either because fruits tend to be a little lower in protein. Uh, or they fail to meet their increased needs like seniors with low energy intakes or poor appetite, pregnant women with morning sickness, they may not get enough protein either. Many people say, but isn't plant protein inferior to animal protein? And the reality is the concern, you know, the concern here is that plant protein is incomplete or they're missing one or more of the nine essential amino acids. And the truth is, all whole plant foods contain all nine essential amino acids. Essential amino acids are essential because animals don't make them. They're made by plants. So it makes no sense to think we can't get them from plants. It's where they come from. So that's, you know, the bottom line. Sometimes the amount of lysine, leucine, or methionine may be low in a single food per gram of protein in that food. This could be, an, a, you know, an issue if we only ate one food, but we don't. We eat a variety of foods. And I think it's really important when we're talking about, you know, the, the sort of quality of protein, plant versus animals, so animal protein, to recognize that protein quality is not just about essential amino acids. It's about how well that, that protein sustains health throughout life. Plant protein reduces risk of mort mortality and disease, animal protein increases risk of mortality and disease. And, and it's also about, you know, to me, uh, how, uh, you know, a, plant, uh, a protein source will support the health of the planet as well. So these are issues that, you know, need to be considered. Uh, as I said, all essential amino acids are made by plants. So we get them directly by eating plants or indirectly by eating animals that eat. Do we need to complement proteins to ensure sufficient essential amino acids? And we've known since the 80s that we don't need to do that, but somehow uh, it's, it's something that people just can't, can't seem to get over. So it's not necessary to complement protein if we eat enough protein and calories. All we need to do is eat a variety of plant foods over the course of the day and include some lysine, leucine-rich choices like legumes, as part of the mix.